Thank you for joining today's Nile webinar. This is Brianne Van Dyne, the Education Manager for Immunize Nevada, and I will be today's moderator. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to review a couple of housekeeping items. In case of communication breakdown, um, please call right back and we will continue the webinar. Uh, first, please locate the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you have any questions, type them in the chat box and we will address those questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. Uh, secondly, if you have requested nursing or pharmacy continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey in the post-webinar email. The email will be sent out by the end of today, and all CEUs will be mailed out within the next week. A little disclaimer, Immunize Nevada, not Nevada's Nile webinars are made possible by the generosity of speakers who donate their time and expertise to benefit the coalition. The expectation and goal is for community partners to gain knowledge on immunization-related topics through a non-branded, unbiased presentation. I'd like, I'd now like to turn it over to our speakers, Dr. Mary Kosla Petraco, who is a Clinical Assistant Professor at Stony Brook University School of Nursing in Stony Brook, New York, and a primary care provider in her own private practice. Dr. Koslot Petraco is also a nurse consultant on the staff of the Immunization Action Coalition. She is a nationally known expert in immunization practice and has been an advisor for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and served on the National Vaccine Advisory Committee. Dr. Koslot Petraco has advised local and state health departments on immunization public policies using her expertise as a public health nurse to influence system level changes. She is the PKIDS Online Advice Nurse, a member of the Executive Board of Every Child by Two, and a Fellow of the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Kosla Petraco. Good after everyone. I'm really thrilled to be able to speak with all of you today. Um, any questions, again, please type them in and we're ready to go. Okay. So here's the first slide. Uh, let's see. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, and just so that you know, too, I have nothing to disclose. I don't work for anybody except for myself. So um, this is a totally unbiased um, presentation. If you'd like to know where the slide deck came from, it's from my, our good friends and colleagues from CDC who readily share this slide deck with all of us in the hope that we can re raise those immunization rates for children um, and get that HPV vaccine into them. Okay. Objectives are all right there for you. I'm not going to read through them if you'd like to read for them, through them. But the goal for us today is to go over some of the things about HPV vaccine and some talking points about how to convince um, not just the parents but the adolescents how to accept this vaccine. I'm going to throw a few of my personal little stories in as we go along because I think some of my experiences might be helpful to you. And don't be afraid to quote me. People do all the time. So we're going to talk about HPV infection and disease first. So there are different types of HPV and their disease associations. There's the mucosal type, which is the sites of infection. This is the one that's the high-risk oncogenic types, the HPV 16 and 18, which are the most common and cause the cervical cancers, the anogenital cancers, oral pharyngeal cancers and the cancer precursors, as well as the low-grade cervical disease. This is the one where, oh, oh goodness, I've got an uh, abnormal pap and I have to start looking, and that's the, the advent of the colposcopy and all the other intervention things that need to be done when we find those, um, those cells. Um, the 6 and 11 are the most common types for the, the genital warts. In fact, those are probably the ones that scare the kids the most because you can absolutely see them. Um, the cutaneous infection or the sites of infection are the common hand and foot warts, and there's about 80 of those. Most females and males, um, most people in the United States are going to be infected with some one of these at some point in their lifetime. It's almost as common as the common cold. 79 million Americans are currently infected. Most people don't even know it. Um, we get about 14 million new infections every year. And HPV infection is the most common uh, infection that we see in teens and in their early 20s. Part of the problem with this, part of the problem with this is that um, sometimes the infection doesn't show up until later in life. The children get infected at that age, but they don't see it um, until later, uh, later on, and that's when they start 
you know, they might have an, um, a positive pap. And then they'll say, well, gee, was, how did I get this? I didn't have that many partners. And then it could be something that they acquired while they were still adolescents. This is a slide. This is one of my, my really um, um, hit the home run slides as far as telling people how many different kinds of cancers that, this, that these viruses cause. And we have to remember, HPV is a virus. It's an infection, and that's how it starts. And I kind of talk about that as an infection when I'm talking to my patients because I think saying it's an infection kind of decreases the stigma for this as well. Um, if you see right there, and where's my little pointer? Um, cervical cancer, it's 91%. Vaginal, vulva, penis, 63%. Anal cancers, rectal, oral, pharyngeal. 70% of oral pharyngeal cancers, and in the boys as well. Um, as we, I, I'd like to mention here about the oral pharyngeal cancers, it's so ubiquitous, it's just all over the place. Just recently, a family member of ours, um, he's 43 years old, perfectly healthy, and he wound up with cancer of the tonsil from um, HPV. It, what, he survived, but it certainly wasn't pretty. He went through a year of m miserable treatment, as he would say, and I can't say that I blame him at all. Um, but the first thing he did was take his three daughters to get the vaccine after he was diagnosed. So I'm hoping we can get to people before we have to have to do the treatment. We have to do treatment so that we can um, we can prevent these kinds of things from occurring. These are the HPV-associated cancer rates by sex, race, and race and ethnicity. Um, my population now is mostly Asian, but when I worked for the health department, my population was mostly Latino with some African Americans. So if you look at those bars there, um, and then there's the distinction between the men and the women, the lighter as, as, for, um, as opposed to the darker, and you look at those, at those uh, this really does not discriminate against anybody. It, it, it hits just about every ethnic group equally. These are the oral pharyngeal cancer rates by sex and ethnicity. And if you look there, we're pretty close there as well, too. I mean, they are. it is lower for the Hispanic. And that's another thing we want to keep, when we start talking to parents, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things. Everybody thinks this is solely sexually transmitted. It's not just um, um, penetration or oral sex. It can be playing around as well, and we'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. This is the associated penile cancer rates with, with, for race and ethnicity. And if you look there, there is a definite uptick in Hispanic and um, a slightly uh, higher rate in uh, the African-American population as well. So we want to make sure that we kind of zoom in on those things when we're talking to those populations about the, the types of infections we're trying to prevent. Uh, and this is with um, cervical cancers for race and ethnicity. Again, pretty much the same across the board, but there is a definitely higher risk there for black and Hispanics as well. So again, making sure that we, we are culturally sensitive and we include that kind of teaching when we're talking to our, our parents as well as the adolescents. Because honestly, in my experience, when you talk to those adolescents, that's a great way to get their parents to agree. This is cervical cancer. is the most common HPV-associated cancer among women. 528,000 cases, 266,000 deaths worldwide. Uh, you know, one of my issues with this also was, all right, we do pap smears in the United States, and we do a pretty good job of, of uh, monitoring, and yes, there is treatment, and most of the time it's successful here in the U.S., but what about women in developing countries? Uh, are they going to have access to this vaccine? And I understand from um, some of the drug companies that I've spoken to that they do have a big program to provide this vaccine in the developing countries as well. Um, because those poor ladies are in worse shape than we are because of the terrible effects of this disease. They are totally shunned and just literally kicked out of their homes because of the symptoms. All right, this is the precancerous, uh, precancerous um, what the cervical changes are. Um, there's 1.4 million new grade uh, cases of low-grade cervical dysplasia in the U.S. every year. 330,000 cases are the high grades. Um, as soon as you get low grade, they're going to start looking. The high grades are the ones that really cause the problem. But again, we want to prevent having to do any kind of interventions because as soon as you start poking around with that cervix in a younger woman, you put that younger woman at risk 
for um, not being able to carry a baby to term. I hear from my women's health um, colleagues that the treatments now are a lot better and there isn't as much at risk as there was, but still, the best way to spare that cervix is to prevent the infection and the, can and the pre cha precancerous changes altogether. This is a really great poster. In fact, if you want this poster, you can get it free from the CDC. Um, HPV is cancer prevention, and that's how we always want to sell it, whether we're selling it to the adolescents or we're selling it to the parents. We have this vaccine for you that's going to prevent cancer. Uh, so we came up with these great prophylactic vaccines. It's a recombinant L1 capsid protein. It's a virus-like particle. It's non-infectious, it's non-oncogenic, and it produces a very high level of neutralizing antibody better than if they had a natural infection. CDC is recommending routine vaccination at 11 to 12 years of age, but you can give it as young as 10. And the advantage to giving it this young is they only have to get uh, two. Excuse me. Um, you can start it as young as nine, not 10. It used to be 10. Sometimes my brain cells um, take a little while to click in. Uh, so the two doses of vaccine are recommended. The biggest problem with this vaccine is that it hurts. So if you only have to give them two vaccine that hurt, vaccines that hurts, it's better than having to give them three. The second dose needs to be given six to 12 months later. If the second dose is given earlier than that, then this child would also have to have the three-dose series. So vaccination for females through 26 years of age and boys through 21 who weren't previously adequately vaccinated, boys through age 22 through 26 may also be vaccinated because, again, this is a double-pronged issue here. It's not all about the girls and it's not all about the boys. That was one of the issues we had with hepatitis B vaccine. When we first started giving this vaccine just to what we considered to be high risk for, eight, for hepatitis B, we didn't do a very good job of eliminating hepatitis B. And it was pretty much the same issue with the HPV vaccine. Just giving it to the girls wasn't enough because very often it was the boys who were the source of the infection. Uh, we also recommend vaccination for ages 26, uh, through ages 26 for gay, bisexual, and any other man who has sex with men, transgendered people, people with certain immune compromising conditions such as HIV infection. Again, their immune system isn't as robust, so we want to make sure that we get that vaccine into them. All right, so here's our dosing schedules. If we start before the 15th birthday, it's two doses. Second dose is six to 12 months later, and the minimum interval between those dose one and dose two is five months. So if the child or the, if the adolescent or child gets it any sooner, then it is a three-dose series. Okay. If they start the vaccination series on or after their 15th birthday, then the second dose is one to two months later, and the third is six months after the first dose, or a one, two, one to two and six month schedule. That minimum interval between dose one and dose three in a three dose schedule is the five months again. All right, let's talk about safety. I have read and heard more scary stories about this vaccine than I care to discuss. All you have to do is put this into any internet uh, search engine and you come up with all of these horrible scare stories, none of which are true. All right, we have a really robust system here in the United States for collecting data on um, vaccine safety. Uh, it's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, better known as VAERS. Um, CDC and FDA are the collaborators, and they are the, uh, the front line for picking up um, adverse events. If a child, I tell people this all the time, and when I used to make um, um, AFIX visits to the private provider's office, I used to tell them all the time, if you have any question whatsoever, anything that happens after a vaccine, just submit it to VAERS. It's no big deal. If it's found to be not a problem, that's fine. And if it is an issue, then what you have done is add to the body of, of knowledge and data that we have in order to determine what, who can receive this vaccine if there was, an ad, um, if there was something uh, related to an adverse event. 
Um, there's also the vaccine safety data link, known as VS, uh, VSD. That's CDC and nine integrated healthcare systems. One of the, uh, you know, um, um, out in California, they have a couple of those great big systems. Those are the ones that are usually involved in these. Um, Humana, I know, is one of them, and I can't remember the names of some of the others. But they're large linked database systems that they actively surveil for any kind of adverse events. And 9.4 million members, it, it's more than 3% of the American population, so that really says a lot. Then there's also the, C, the CESA centers. That's the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project. It's CDC and seven academic centers. And um, I know you guys are out in Nevada, and I'm not exactly certain where your center is, but right here in New York, we have one in New York City that's associated with Columbia University. I've spoken to the, the docs who work there, and it's just a pleasure to speak with them. They're happy to speak with you on the phone. They'll take a referral from you, um, any, anything that they can do to support you. Then there's also the post-licensure rapid immunization safety monitoring program known as PRISM. That's FDA and six other partner organizations. And this is a large distributed database system used for active surveillance and research. And this reaches over 170 million individuals. So I think we can very comfortably say to parents, we have a really good monitoring system here and a really good support system should something occur following this vaccine. And also, we looked at all of this data that's come in through these systems, and we haven't seen anything that would give us cause to say that this is not a safe vaccine. Okay. So we have over 10 years of data. It's safe. Uh, reactions, the big – and be honest. Tell the kids, hey, this is going to hurt. Unfortunately, this vaccine stings when I give it. And you know what? It's, your arm is going to hurt tomorrow, too, probably. You might feel like I punched you in the arm. So as soon as you get home, get a nice washcloth and put cold water on that washcloth and put that cold compress on your arm, oh, for about 10 minutes out of every hour for, um, for the next 24 hours. And that will really help a lot. And also, make sure you move that arm. We want to give them tools and prepare them so that, that they're not frightened to come back another time. There's nothing worse than the parent goes home, the kid has an arm, and the kid says, oh, my arm is going to fall off, and the mother says, I'm not getting that vaccine again. But when you warn them, that makes a really, really big difference. Uh, we also should not be giving um, the vaccine to anyone who's had an allergy to either Gardasil or Gardasil 9. Um, I, I forgot to mention about the systemic fever and headaches. Quite honestly, I have never seen them, and I don't even remember how many bazillions of doses that I've given. But there is the chance, so you should warn the parents about that, too. The biggest issue with our adolescents are the fainting spells, and I think it's because they get very nervous. They come to us without eating. They hold their breath. It's not like a little one who's going to cry and scream and say, okay, I'm going to get all my frustrations out and all my fear out. The adolescent bottles their fear up, and as a result, you wind up with a fainting child. So always, always, always warn the parent, well, listen, you know, I hope they have, did they have breakfast? We're going to make sure they sit, and we're going to have them sit for a little while longer because there is a chance with adolescents because they get so nervous that they can faint after this vaccine, okay? Um, I do have some colleagues who lay adolescents down during the vaccination and make them stay that way for 15 minutes. And if that works for you, that's another good um, alternative for um, preventing syncope. All right, so what's the vaccine impact? Early outcomes, HPV prevalence, genital warts, mid-outcomes, years to decades, the SIN changes and the precancerous changes, and the late outcomes, decades later, HPV-associated cancer. So let's talk a little bit about those. All right, so prevalence of HPV before and after introduction into the United States. Now, we haven't got as good um, um, data with giving the full series because we're not too good at finishing the series. We're pretty decent at getting the first dose into them, as you can see from this slide. Um, but there's been a 64% decline just simply by getting one dose into them in the 14- to 19-year-old age group. There's been a 34% decline in the 20- to 24% age group and the 25- to 29% age group. Um, we really haven't seen much decline at all because we haven't, been very, we haven't gotten enough doses into them. So this is what happened in Australia. Australia mandates this vaccine, and the proportion of Australian females 
born, um, uh, both born females and males diagnosed as having genital warts at their first age group by visit. And look at how those numbers dropped. Um, you can see why that red line there, the way the numbers have dropped, this is really a significant impact. Um, in fact, a, a colleague of mine, that's how she convinces the adolescents to get to take the vaccine. She's got a picture of a couple of nasty pictures of warts on the inside of one of her cabinets. And when she's discussing what this vaccine prevents, she opens the door and shows the adolescents. And it's not a tough sell for the adolescent to say, I think I want that ma sign the paper. Because um, there are some practices who still have signatures um, requested in, in order to get the vaccine. It's not just a verbal. So the systematic review and meta-analysis at the population level impact of this vaccine, they reviewed 20 studies in nine high-income countries and countries with greater than 50% coverage among those 13 to 19-year-olds. They saw that 68% decrease that I showed you earlier with the, the oncogenic types and the genital warts decreased by more than 61%. Um, so there is evidence of herd immunity here, um, and there is evidence of some cross protection against other types that are not covered specifically by the vaccine. So now the big thing is how long does it last? When I used to make my AFIX visits, the providers used to say to me, well, I don't want to give it this young. I don't want to give it at 11 to 12 because they're probably not having sex, and I want to make sure they're going to be covered when they get older. Well. We have really good evidence that's at least 10 years old that shows there's no waning protection. So that makes me feel very comfortable about getting that vaccine into those children at a younger age. The other advantage giving it at the younger age um, is that it, they mount an even better immune response. So the young, uh, it's a great way to tell the parents, I know your children aren't going to have sex until they get married. I used to tell my patients that all the time. But, you know, this vaccine works so much better if we give it to them now. By the time they do grow up, get married, and have sex, um, the vaccine is still going to be on board for them just in case the person they married had, a, you know, uh, an infection somewhere along the line. So you are protecting your child literally for the rest of their life against this, this cancer. So how are we going to talk about this? This is the big issue. All right. All right. Now, if you look at these numbers, we do a pretty decent job. We do a great job with Tdap. We do a great job with MCV4, um, and that's because most of the time those vaccines are mandated by school. Um, girls, we're doing a little bit better um, getting that first dose into them. Boys, we're getting there. We had a little slower start with the boys. Um, three doses of HPV for the girls, yeah, we're not getting there yet. We're only in the 30s. And the boys were in the mid-20s. So we need to do a much better job. We're just beginning to see an uptick in the second dose of uh, MCV4, and I think that also is related to the school requirements. So this is the impact of eliminating missed opportunities by, um, by age 13 in girls born uh, in, 2000, in year 2000. Um, we actually gave 47% of them um, the vaccine, but we could have gotten to 91 if we didn't miss opportunities. They come in for working papers. They come in for pimples. They come in because they have a strep throat. They come in um, for mm, uh, a sports injury. Those are all opportunities to vaccinate, and they're considered missed opportunities if we don't. Now, Let's talk about some of the reasons why we don't give the vaccine for children. Um, there's a whole bunch of lists there, but what's the big one? It's not recommended. Overwhelmingly, parents said that the provider didn't recommend it or suggested it be given later. So the onus is on us. And honestly, we as providers, whether we're pharmacists, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, we can own this and get this done for this population so we can virtually eliminate this, um, these cancers in the United States. All right, so here's, this is my project that I did for, my Haitian, for the Haitian Nurses Association in Brooklyn. I was invited to come and speak to them. And they, were, they really were not too crazy about this vaccine. They had heard a lot of these really awful stories. So um, I talked to them. I wanted them to own this. 
I wanted them to feel they were very active in their community and they felt that their community's health was really dependent on them as a group. So I, we talked about HPV vaccine and why it was important and what, what they could do with suggestions from them how they felt that they could get this increased in their community. Okay. Um, one of the nurse, several of the nurses said that when they took their own adolescents in, um, the provider didn't explain it and just said, I want to give this vaccine. And, then, and the, um, the nurses said, well, why? And they said, oh, because it's good for them or because I said so or, you know, some other, um, well, we'll talk about it later. I just said it's good for them. It prevents cancer and that's the end of it. But they didn't give the nurses the opportunity to any, answer any questions. Um, some of the nurses also believed that the vaccine would make their children t um, more likely to have sex sooner rather than later. Now, this Haitian community is extremely family-centered. They absolutely adore their children, and they also want their children to wait to have sex. They're all very, um, the, they were very active in their church communities where early sexual experience was frowned upon. So it was talking to them and getting ideas from them about how to get this across to their communities. Um, uh, they said, or some of them said the providers didn't even mention the vaccine. Um, they all, or the provider didn't think that the, it was important for their children. Uh, and several of the nurses had heard about side effects. Either they had seen them uh, in print or seen them on the Internet. So one by one, we addressed each one of their, of their hesitations and empowered those nurses to go back into the community to get the, their, their, um, their community members to get, come for the vaccine. And several of the nurses told me after the, we got finished with our project that they were going to back to their providers and insist that their children get the vaccine right now. Um, just to give you another example, another pediatrician friend of mine took her 11-year-old daughter in to another pediatrician for her HPV vaccine, and she said, I want the vaccine. Um, and the pediatrician said, uh, it's too early. And this happens to be a public health pediatrician as well. And the pediatrician said, you're kidding me, right? No, 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 I don't want it. So she really, she said, <laughs> it was almost a knockdown, drag out battle between her and the pediatrician. She won. But she said, why am I saying this to the pediatrician? She said, I'm a public health doc, and I had to beg for an HPV vaccine. So, again, it's changing our mindset. This is good vaccine. The younger we give it, the more robust the immune response it is. We're out there preventing cancer. All right, now this is the value that the parents prevent, um, present, um, pr put on the vaccines, and the parents pretty much put the same value on the HPV vaccine as they did on the others. Um, this is uh, what the clinician estimates were. Uh, they really underestimated 5.2 what the parent place thought about the vaccine. I mean, I've heard it from several providers. Oh, the parents, parents don't want it. They're afraid of it. They think it's going to have their children have sex. But this is all pre uh preconceived notions on our part as providers. So the real perceived and real concerns of parents influence how clinician recommends and administers that vaccine. So it's up to us to make those recommendations. Okay, so what we want to do is give an effective recommendation to give HPV vaccine at ages 11 or 12, okay? An effective recommendation from you is the main reason that a parent decides to vaccinate. And honestly, um, I, I, don't I haven't really done a, a hard-on study to look at this um, in my own population, but anecdotally I can tell you this, having spoken to groups of nurses and uh, physicians all over the country, that it, a lot of it has to do with the way we feel about this vaccine and how we sell it to the parent. Many moms in that focus group stated they trust us and would get the vaccine as long as they received that recommendation from, from, our, from their provider. So, again, you, it's how take that minute or two and talk to the parent. Give them the chance to, to ask a question. So what is an effective recommendation for HPV vaccination? I think I've kind of been throwing a few of these little things in as, as we go along, so I'm just gonna, we're going to go over them with a little more specific. Same way, same day, okay? 
we like to talk about this as making this effective recommendation to all groups of the adolescent vaccines. We're going to bundle them. Same recommendation for HPV as the everything else. We're going to recommend all three of those adolescent vaccines all at the same time. Tdap, HPV, meninge. Your teenager today needs these three, or preteen needs these three vaccines today. Not instead of, do you want these vaccines? If you say, do you want, it puts, well, do I want them? Do I really want them? But we, when we as providers say, your preteen needs these vaccines today to prevent against meningitis, HPV cancers, and pertussis or whooping cough, because a lot of times they don't know what pertussis means, so make sure we use the term that they need. This is the bundling. Three vaccines, all the same, all together, the same day. Okay. So here's some, uh, these are some, some scenarios for you. Now Sylvie is 11, she's due for the three vaccines today. These will help protect her from infections that cause meningitis, HPV, and pertussis. We're going to give all of these shots at the end of the visit. Um, some parents need some reassurance. So if they have some questions, um, some will just say, okay, fine. Others may be interested in vaccine, vaccinating but still have questions. Um, interpret as a question as they need some additional reinsurance from us. Um, I've heard parents say, well, you know, I heard that vaccine causes um, ovarian failure. You know, and my response to them is, well, I heard that too. But you know what? I looked up the science behind that, and there is absolutely no science. There has never been a case of ovarian failure related to this vaccine. Um, most of the, ch um, from the children that they saw this, it was related to an autoimmune disorder that was not related to the vaccine. Give them that little piece of information so that they feel comfortable. Um, and make sure that you address their real concerns. Uh, why does my child need HPV vaccine? Also, addressing the adolescent, why they need HPV vaccine. Because sometimes when you have a hesitant parent, you can convince the adolescent. Um, I, um, I, have, I think I mentioned to you, um, I see mostly adolescents now, and I wasn't doing too well with the girls when just saying, okay, we have this HPV vaccine. Um, and then I started talking about the kinds of cancers, the cervical cancers, and all of a sudden, the girls started accepting the vaccine. But I was doing a lousy job with the boys. I was telling them about the cancers and, you know, this vaccine prevents cancer. And then one day I blurted out to one of the teenage boys, this vaccine prevents cancer of the penis. He looked at his mother and he said, um, tell the nurse I want the vaccine. So whatever works, works. Um, I was a little embarrassed, too, because it was an Asian community, and I thought maybe I sent something culturally insensitive. So I checked with some Asian Americans who are first generation that I know, and they said, no, that's the, what you have to do. If that's what works for the boys, continue to do that. So again, make sure you think about the culture that you're, you're working with. Um, like with the Haitian community, it was making, uh, emphasizing to that community that this vaccine did not cause the children to have premarital sex. With the Asian boys that I was working with, it was telling them about cancer of the penis was the, was the key for me to get them to accept the vaccine. So making sure that you're aware of what's going on in your communities, okay? And what we're going to say to these parents is, this vaccine is important because it prevents cancer. That's why I'm recommending you start that vaccine today. Okay. So what cancers are caused by HPV infection, if that's a question that they give you? Um, Certain types of HPV cause cancer of the cervix, vagina, vulva, and females, which can affect fertility later on. It can cause cancer of the penis in men, and both girls and boys, anus and throat. And if you want to throw in my war story about, you know, our family member who just recently had uh, cancer of the, of the tonsil, throw it in, okay? We can prevent these infections with, these, with HPV vaccines. Um, so let's do that by starting this vaccine today. Is my child really at risk for HPV? I can't tell you how many times I've gotten that question. And what we tell them is it's a common infection. It's as common as a cold. Um, if we had a, a vaccine for the cold, we sure would take that vaccine and colds don't cause cancer. Um, we can help protect your child from these cancers caused by this vi these viruses starting by, by giving that vaccine today. 
It only works if we give it to your child. And we need to give your child's body the opportunity to build up that immunity so by the time they get older and start uh, having sex, the vaccine is going to be on board. No parent ever wants to think their kid is going to have sex. So, you know, my way of doing that is kind of telling them, I know they're not going to have sex for a long time. I mean, I have three sons, uh, two sons, and, of course, I wanted them to wait to have um, uh, sex as well. We used to have the condom drawer, and I used to tell them I would never check on how many condoms were in there except to refill it as needed until one day the drawer was empty, and I was panic-stricken. And I, was, I went to my younger son, and I said, oh, my God, what happened? And he said, oh, Mom, it's okay. I was just handing them out at school. I said, I hope you didn't tell those kids where, they, where those condoms came from. He said, no, Ma, he says, but you have no idea how many STDs and pregnancies you prevented. I said, well, I hope you didn't tell them I gave you those condoms and you bought them somewhere. I didn't want to get in trouble with the school district. But, you know, here's my son trying to be a good public health person as well. Why so young? Why at 11 to 12 years old? Um, well, okay, here's some reasons. We put our seatbelts on before turning on the car, right? Before we even leave the air, uh, the driveway, or before we, or or do we put it on when we uh, we get near a car accident? We all put our car seats on, our our seats on as soon as we get in the car. This is the same concept. We want to get that vaccine on board so by the time your child gets older, and starts having sex, they already have their seat belt on and they're protected against these cancers. Also, telling the parents if they wait till age 15, then. We, um, we have to give them three shots instead of two. So let's get that started today. And then they only have to come back in 12 months, in six months, and um, they're done with the two-shot series before age 15. I'm worried that this is going to be a green light to give my have my child have like, have, start having sex. Okay. And then you're going to tell them about the studies. We have plenty of studies that shows that this doesn't make the children much more likely to have start, start having sex at a younger age. But giving them that vaccine now is the best time to stimulate that immune response in your children. It works better the younger we give it. How long can we wait and still give just two doses? Okay. All right. The two-dose schedule is recommended if we start before the 15th birthday. But I don't want to wait that long because the younger we give this vaccine, um, the better it works, and also it's harder to get your children in here the older they get. And then you only have to come for two appointments instead of three appointments. So I feel it's best to start that series today. Okay. I have some concerns about the safety. I keep reading these things online that say the vaccine isn't safe. How do I know it's safe? Okay. Seen lots of stories in the media about these vaccines, but I want you to know that the vaccine's been studied um, and based on all the data I've seen, I believe the vaccine is very safe. And if your children have been vaccinated, tell them that. I always told them, my sons were vaccinated. My daughters-in-law were vaccinated. Most of my nieces and nephews were vaccinated. So I feel perfectly comfortable about this vaccine. Okay. Vaccines, like any medicine, can cause side effects. And with this vaccine, it could be the sore arm, swelling, redness, you know, maybe even a headache or a, or a, um, a fever. Um, and the, make sure you tell them about the fainting. Sometimes children do faint when they get the shots. Um, so that's why we seat them all and we make sure we watch them for the first few minutes after we'll, we, we give that vaccine so we can protect your child. Could the vaccine cause my child to have problems with? Okay. No data available that says that this vaccine can affect future fertility. But having HPV infections could if they have to start poking around the cervix. So we're preventing that. Um, women, some of these treatments could prevent their ch uh, ability and limit their ability to have children. So why would we want to do that? If we give them the vaccine, we start the series today, we can prevent that happening and, and, and protect your daughter's ability to bear children. More than a decade of HPV vaccine safety studies have been very reassuring. We haven't seen any signs that show that causes any problems with any of these conditions that are listed here. Death, neurological conditions, autoimmune, venous thrombosis, 
orthostatic type tachycardia syndrome, or complex regional uh, pain syndrome. And if you want more data about that, CDC has lots of things on their website, and so does the Immunization Action Coalition about the specific conditions and the studies that were done related to each one of those conditions. I didn't have a whole lot of time today to go over each one of those in detail. Okay. How do I know the vaccine works? Ongoing studies continue to show that the vaccine really works great. I'm, and mention those 10-year studies, and that's just the beginning. Every year, those, those titers have not dropped off. HPV infections, genital warts, cervical uh, precancerous conditions have decreased in the years that this vaccine is available. Tell them about those studies in Australia. So starting that vaccine series today is the best chance that we can protect your child. Why do boys need the vaccine? Well, infections can cause cancers in men also. Penis, anus, and throat in men and, uh, and uh, also cause those genital warts. And getting that vaccine today for your son can prevent infections that can lead to these diseases, okay? We also know that in the past, most of the time, it was the boys who were the source of the infection for the girls. We only want the vaccines we need for school. For that sort, too. All three of these vaccines are strongly recommended and equally recommended by CDC. And all three are also recommended by pediatric, adolescent, family medicine, physician groups, and nurse practitioner groups. Um, school entry requirements don't always reflect the current recommendations for your child's health. Just take a look at which state you're in. In New York State, we follow the ACA, ACIP guidelines, but we don't mandate HPV vaccine but I certainly recommend that for your children. Would you get this vaccine for your children? You bet I would, okay? I've given this vaccine to my own sons, and then you can tell them about your own children as well. And then also back it up with AAP, AAFP, NIH, CDC. Um, all agree that getting the vaccine for your child is very important. When do we need to come back? Okay. Since your child is younger than 15, they need a second shot in six months to a year. I always, I don't kind of, I kind of shy away from that year because I'm afraid I'm going to lose them, so I tell them six months. Um, there, are, there are data out there that show if you text the adolescent, if you get permission from the parent to text the adolescent, that even increases the rate of the children coming back for the, uh, the subsequent doses but never let them leave your office without an appointment. Um, so when you're checking out, make sure you make that appointment for the second shot so it can be put on your calendar before you even leave today. It's a great way. And, of course, reminder recalls. Um, and there's those telephone things now that you can put on your phone that you can, uh, they have like um, the robo-automatic redial things that will, will automatically remind the patients. They're just wonderful. And now, the, if your child's 15, they're going to need another shot in one to two months, and the third shot is six months from today. Please don't leave without getting an appointment to come back for that next shot. Um, I usually, depending on where the child is going, if they're going away to college or if they're staying around, to, will probably usually determine for me whether I tell them to come back in four weeks or eight weeks. Okay. So if the parent doesn't say yes, what are you going to do? Okay, ask and um, make sure that you understand their concerns. Um, acknowledge and emphasize it's the parent's decision, uh, acknowledge the risks and conflicting information, and praise them for wanting to do what's best for their child. And just be clear that you're concerned for their health of their child and not just public health safety. Um, advise them and give them time to discuss the pros and cons of the vaccine. I usually send them home with a vaccine information statement and tell them that they, you know, on the next visit we'll chat about it again. Um, and always be willing, acknowledge their concerns um, be willing to discuss their ideas. Um, send them to good websites. Um, vaccinateyourfamily.org is great. Um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. CDC is wonderful, but sometimes it's kind of hard to wade through all this stuff. It's a lot easier to find information through um, Vaccinate Your Family. And, um, in fact, we just redid the whole website. It's absolutely drop-dead gorgeous and so easy to find things on it now with all kinds of wonderful links. Um, Tailor your advice using this presentation. 
like I mentioned to you, you can go right to CDC's website and pull this whole presentation up right now. I'm sure you can download it. I think um, that the um, um, Nevada um, Health Department has made this available to you. Um, if you have any kind of trouble, you can even email me. I'll help you find it. Um, use these things. They're tools that are there for you. So how to increase the number of targeted patients who come in and leave vaccinated. Know your coverage rates. Um, get your AFIX rates. You can pull them up yourself. If you have a registry, pull them up yourself. When I went to do my, um, I mean, I, anecdotally, I thought I was doing a better job getting the HPV vaccine into the children, but we went, went right to the nicest, to the New York State Immunization Registry, and we pulled them up ourselves to see how much, um, how much we had improved. You can use your EHRs as well. Okay. Um, make sure everybody in your office is on the same page as you are. Um, every single person from the front desk person to the, um, to the checkout person should be pushing vaccines and be on, the, on board with them. All a parent has to hear is one negative thing, and that's you're going to have trouble getting the vaccine into them. Um, the check-in lady, she was saying, oh, your child's due for vaccines today. Make sure you discuss those with your provider. Um, but if the, and if the parent says, well, did you get your child? Uh, well, I don't think I want to have... That's, I'm, I'm going to do that for my children, or they hesitate a little. Regardless of what those staff members think on their own, they have to be giving the same exact message that you do. And this is the top ten list for HPV successes, and you can get that at hashtag VACSuccess. Okay. Um, get all of your staff members together. Go over this slide deck with them. Um, go over talking points. Role play with them. Share tips with them. Um, all these things are very, very helpful to increase your rates. Okay. Um, this is CDC's website for HPV. You are the key. And like I said, everything is there for you. It's downloadable. Um, terrific resources. So this is my final slide. HPV is cancer prevention, and you are the key to getting those numbers up. And, you, like I, and here are my references. Um, I love references. I'll never hand you anything without a reference. Um, I try to give you all live um, uh, uh, web links that you, all you have to do is point and click. So I think I have finished what I have to say for today. So if you have any questions, if you put them in the chat box, um, I think we're going to address them now. And thank you all so much for coming to listen to me today. Thank you so much, Dr. Kofla Petraco. Uh, before we say goodbye, we'd like to offer a little more time for last minute questions. So please type those questions in the chat box now. Um, I did provide a couple of the websites uh, for HPV information for you guys uh, within that participant feedback um, chat box there too, just for reference. Um, while we are waiting for those questions to be typed in, just a couple of reminders. If you have requested nursing or pharmacy continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey, which will pop up on your screen when the webinar is ended, or in the post-webinar email if you don't have a chance to complete it right away following the webinar. The email will be sent out by the end of today, and all CEUs will be mailed out within the next week. And if you'd like to view or share this webinar, the recording will be available on our website along with information for future webinars. Please visit immunizenevada.org forward slash webinars for those details. That should be posted within the next, uh, next week as well. Um, and Dr. Koslop, we did get a couple of uh, questions that came in. Um, one of them was, it seems to, that many have a distrust of the government itself and do not want to give immunizations because the government recommends it. How do you deal with that? Well, then I kind of don't talk to, as much about the government. I talk much more about places like Vaccinate Your Family. VaccinateYourFamily.org is the website for um, Every Child by Two, and it's not government run. Um, it's, um, it's a terrific place to, um, to get uh, information. And if I, if I have families that I think are um, distrustful of the government, uh, you know, that's what I would say to them, um, that this is a terrific place where um, we have really good science, um, and um, it's all about vaccinating your family. There's also um, several other coalitions that are available um, that, um, that I send them to. Um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is another one. It's not, you know, it's not a government um, website. Um, immuniza um, Immunization Action Coalition also has a lot of stories from families, and there's um, 
Um, I'm just ha- uh, Karen Ernst, and I'm just having a brain freeze right now. She has a terrific site. It's run totally by parents about um, for vaccination. Um, uh, and afterwards, oh, I will talk, and you can send this one out to them too, because I'm just having a brain freeze right now, and I can't remember what the name of her website is. But she's got a great organization going that's totally parent-run for information about vaccines. Um, so that's what I would do if I had a family that was, was concerned about, the, you know, the trusting the government. Perfect. I think that's a great point too. And, and I would just like to add to that as well, um, just in my experience with doing adolescent AFIX visits, um, as helpful as of a resource as those pharmaceutical websites can be, um, there is kind of that distrust of big pharma as well. So I think any of those websites that um, Dr. Petraco had discussed um, in addition to um, the CDC or um, AAP or any of those resources, um, immunize.org, like she had mentioned, was, would be super helpful um, as well. Um, and I don't see that any other um, questions have come through at this time. Oh, there's one that just popped up. Um, have you had any experience getting through to a parent that may be an anti-vaxxer? They're the toughest people to, to, to deal with. But you know what? We don't want to ignore them. Um, I have very mixed feelings about uh, discharging them from a practice if they are anti-vax parents. I, I mean, I certainly do understand the, the concern that you bring an unvaccinated child into an office and you've got all, and if the kids, other children get sick from them, you know, not only are you going to make another child sick, but there's the, the, the liability involved as well. I honestly never give up on them. You know, and I and I I I, I acknowledge their their concerns, but I tell them. But every time you come to visit me, I'm going to talk to you again, and I'm going to send you back to my good websites like Vaccinate Your Family and uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I'm hoping at some point along the line we can we can start somewhere with your children. And again, with a smile on my face and the concern for their children, and just say to them, you know, I really want the best for your children. Another way that I sometimes can get through to them is, you know, talking about the things in my own family. My sister almost died from measles. My mother, God rest her soul, just died at 98 years old this April, and she had polio. And my mother was actually out there um, talking to nursing students in Westchester County uh, about the experiences of a polio survivor. She never called herself a victim. She called herself a survivor. She spent the last five years of her life in a wheelchair because the, the paralysis came back again. So sometimes telling those family stories can be very helpful too. And if you want to share my family stories, my family is happy to, to, to let you share them. In fact, my mother would be smiling down from heaven knowing that you were talking about her experiences and how she wanted all children vaccinated because she didn't want anybody to have to go through the polio that she had to go through. No, I think it's a great um, uh, any sort of personal anecdote is definitely helpful. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, what we can. I, Karen, I'm sorry. I just go ahead. My head. I'm so sorry. Karen Ernst's website is Voices for Vaccines. She's got a dynamic website that's totally run by parents who are very pro-vaccine, who have nothing to do with the government, drug companies, or anything else. So that's another really sensational place to send parents who are fearful of the government. It's Voices for Vaccines. Perfect. And I just posted that in the chat box as well, just so the participants oh, can take note you. of that too. Um, well, great. If there's any other questions, we'll go ahead and um, address those in um, personal messages back to participants. Um, we want to thank you for um, Dr. Petraco for agreeing to come and present for us today. And thank you to all of uh, you who participated in today's uh, Nile webinar. Have a great day. Bye.